You cannot be a strong finance minister if you don't get the backing of your president, because you will last. But in this particular case, if he sacks him, they will go and solve it at home. He doesn't want to carry the problems of government to the house. It does appear that you no longer think <laughs> that the vice president fits that description. Or that Maguire should be compared to the vice president. Yes. Yeah, so so, what so over time, I have watched the vice president, I have watched Maguire. And it does appear that it is a very wrong comparison. It's a very wrong comparison because I compared a very huge talent who took on criticisms and feedback from across the world, including myself, and turned that into motivation and focus on doing the talking on the field. And the results are there to show that after that, he, he, he had a couple of patches, but he's been outstanding for club and country. Contrary, Hello, Maguire. That's Dr. Baumia. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has gotten worse. So the comparison in the first place was wrong. And when he started performing, I felt that in all sincerity and genuinely, I felt that I owed him an apology on the same platform and with the same force. But why wants you to go to Old Trafford? He's inviting you to Old Trafford. Are you going to Old Trafford? Yeah, that, well, I, I need to say that at some point when my, my routine and my, my, my time permits, I'm, I'm a lover of football. Uh, so yes, it will be good to, to apologize to him in person and to bring finality and closure to this conversation. So if it is possible, why not? It's a, it's a great invitation. Don't forget that he, he was the, the captain of, of England. Back to talk time, and as I indicated, we are looking at the 2024 budget and its ramifications for all of us. And we have in the studio a very special guest, somebody who has been in the middle of all of this discussion, somebody who is quite articulate and appears to know what he talks about. We have in the studio the Honorable Isaac Adongo, Member of Parliament. So you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. I'm good to see you once again. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's been a while. Quite a while. Good to see you look like a 50-year-old. Oh, whoa. Yeah. The looks are different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the looks are different from yeah. the feeling, you know. Uh, yeah, I can understand. But, sir, this, this budget, mm. 2024 budget, what is in it? What does it mean? I mean... Okay, so if you look at the budget as was presented, uh, you could see the finance minister had a very difficult task coming to us after all that has happened. Uh, an economy that has been run into a situation where we basically had to go to the IMF and we had taken on a couple of obligations that are not palatable. But also the fact that this was the economy that uh, basically went to the people that it had borrowed from, both domestic and external, to say, look, we just cannot pay you, even though we came and told you that we're running this economy in such a way that will create prosperity and they will be able to pay you back and still build the Ghana that we want, uh, we simply got it wrong and we just cannot pay you. So now coming to Parliament, what exactly were you coming to tell us? So you notice that this budget was loaded with, if you wish, seminal points that were supposed to sway the people and to get the people feel that there was somehow some something in the budget. So when you hear the finance minister now move away from the traditional measure of economic performance to some medieval uh, uh, methods, then you know something is wrong. I mean, I don't remember the last time in economic history that we used nominal GDP to measure performance. That is medieval. And, and so you see that that became part of a seminal point to suggest that, look, somehow we should be celebrating a projection uh, based on nominal values. And, and, and so inflation doesn't matter. You know, uh, the depreciation of the currency doesn't matter. And somehow everything we will see appears to be money that will be in Ghanaian pockets. And yet when we put our hands there, we see that the pockets are torn. 
So that was a seminal point, you know, basically to to cloud all these difficulties that we're going and say, look, you're going to have a lot of money next year. Yeah, we've heard that before, you know, promises of this government. Abu so kind people were celebrating to their own detriment mm -hmm. and all of that. So that was the first point. Then he said, look, we've impacted you positively since 2017. Another seminal point, which basically was meant to let you feel that your life is better than what you know. Uh, and Ghanaians know their lives, and they know whether or not you have impacted them positively. So again, to keep asking you to be searching, have I, have I really been impacted positively? Mm -hmm. You know, instead of asking the question, you promised me something, you haven't delivered, you should be apologizing to the people of Ghana. You should be telling us how we ended up being a bankrupt country. We should be telling us how we ended up, you know, basically denying pensioners their money to buy their medicine and all of that. You should be telling us how you raided the Bank of Ghana to print money worth 80 billion and what did you use it for? They make you begin to focus the attention on something else that doesn't exist. So immediately I heard those points, I was very convinced in my mind that we're dealing with some strictness. We're dealing with sloganeering. We're dealing with policy disorientation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is exactly what it is. Uh, if you want to expand further, even the calculation, like, like I said in Parliament, even when you are trying to cook the data, you are not even smart about it. If you say that your economy will grow from 850 billion in nominal terms, and of course 850 billion, that was based on inflation of almost about 54 percent that had driven that number. Uh, the city almost somewhere around 15 Ghana cities. So mm -hmm. even with the same amount of, of volume of goods and services, you would expand from 600 billion to 850. But in terms of real value, it means nothing. So you say you grow it from there to uh, 1050 trillion. One, that's about 1 trillion. That's about 22% expansion in nominal value. So you want to see whether this is driven by price or this is driven by actual economic activity. So you go to look at the price. And when you go to inflation, it says I will move inflation from 35% to 15%, which means that is going to gain in real value 20%. Okay. So I said, okay, so that, that means that your output is not influenced by price because prices are going to come down anyway. So how can you grow your volumes by 22% and then improve on the real value, the purchasing power, by 20% and still grow at a real GDP of 2.8%? It just doesn't add up because if you add the 22% of volume to improvement in purchasing power of 20%, the economy should be growing at around 22-23%. So when we now ask you, so when you combine all of this, what is the effect? You say 2.8%. You're not even being smart in cooking the numbers. Are you getting the point? So clearly, something fundamentally is wrong. So this was just a seminar point meant to sway us from having a discussion on nominal GDP as opposed to the real growth of the economy. If we were to grow at 2.8% from 2.3% last year, at this pace, it will take us over 50 years to get back to where we were before you, you, you mismanage this economy. Then we even ask, this 15%, it's miraculous that you don't have a track record of reducing inflation by 20%. So. We begin to ask you, when you went to the IMF, one of the clauses in your agreement is what we call the Monetary Policy Consultation Clause. And that Monetary Policy Consultation Clause allows you to bring all the data from monetary policy to fiscal support and complementary fiscal policy that would impact your inflation. Mm -hmm. When you brought those data, you and the IMF agreed that in 2024, your inflation will be an average of 27%. Now, when it comes to inflation, you use a band. Then you decide where you want to land on the band based on your best effort. So we say, okay, your minimum will be, they say, okay, your inflation band will be 29.8% mm -hmm. with an asymmetry of 4%. What it means is that your inflation is going to be a range of 29.8% 
plus or minus 4%. So if you subtract 4, you get the lowest band, which is 25.8. Mm -hmm. If you add 4, you get the highest band, which is 33.8. So does 15% look like that range? Mm -hmm. Does 15% look like 24.8 to 33.8? Of course, 27% is within the range. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you said that your best effort is that you will land at an average of 27%. Now you come and tell a cook, a cook and boost story that is 15%. Clearly, you have cooked the number by over uh, uh, 17%. Okay. And if we take your highest band, you cook the number by almost 19%. Mm. So it is quite clear that your nominal GDP is influenced by inflation, mm -hmm. which inflation you are hiding by cooking the number to 15%. So clearly it's obvious that this was just a point to sway us. But the reality is that you are still expecting elevated levels of inflation and that our livelihoods are not going to get any better uh, you know, in 2024. Then we said this is happening because you are spending money that you don't have. And on the basis of that, you go around borrowing people's money you know, just to spend. And it is a reason that your debt became so high that it was assessed to be unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So going forward, your focus ought to be how you generate resources domestically in order that you slow down on borrowing. In any case, the market is already shut to you. The capital markets, particularly the Eurobond markets, when they hear your name, everybody is hiding their money. Because I Ghana, when they take your money, you won't get it. In the domestic bond market, the only people who are giving you money are the people who give you money as, as precaution. So they are not able, they don't want to give you money for more than one year. 91 days, 182 days, or maximum 364 days. So that when they sense that things are going bad, they take their money back. So nobody will give you money for two years, three years, four years. So the bond market is gone. You are basically restricted to the money market, uh, the money market which is short-term instruments. Okay. So it means that if you decide to spend more, you are going to have a problem. You will end up borrowing more. And you have agreed with the IMF that you rather will focus on growing your revenue. So you do 16.8% of GDP. But it is not a wish. It is about what the economy can give you. So you tell us that your economy, you expect that at the end of the year, you will get 133 billion. We said that's marvelous. That's about 15.7%. You are getting close. Then you tell us that you will grow the economy's revenue by 0.9% of GDP. Never mind that your GDP has been inflated. We'll give that to you, which works up to 9 billion. Okay. So if you add 9 billion to 133 billion, you get 132 billion. So how did you pluck 176 billion revenue from the moon? Okay. So quite clearly, you've added, you've bloated your revenue projection by over 32 billion because it's in an election year. You've used that projected revenue that you cannot realize, which is not based on your own narrative. In fact, even if we decide that you move from the 15.7% to 16.8%, that is a growth of 1.1% of revenue to GDP. Okay, that gives you 11 billion. If you add 11 billion to 133 billion, you get 144 billion. So whichever way you look at it, you're not going to be able to make 176 billion. You have over 30 billion built in a revenue that you cannot get. And then you use that revenue to build an expenditure forecast. Okay, then you say, oh, we'll do a deficit of 51 billion. Then I get 226 billion. Okay, meanwhile your revenue per the, the projections and per, per all the assumptions that you have given us, you cannot get 176. Then you add once you add that deficit to 176, and you say that I'm going to spend 226 billion. Inbuilt in that 226 billion is 30 to 32 billion that you have not justified where you are going to get it from. Your revenue measures reflect either a growth of 9% or a growth of 1.1%. If we take the highest, which is 1.1%, you are getting 144 billion. Okay, so where are you going to get the money to spend up to 226 billion? You know the catch? 
So your parliament approves 236 billion, you have a ceiling. You have to stay within that. Meanwhile, that 30 billion is locked in there. 32 billion is locked in there. So if you are not getting the revenue, you borrow. And you will not be, you will not be violating any laws. Mm -hmm. But of course, your deficit will go up. But you see, all this will become real when you have left office in 2025. So far, the picture you are painting is one that looks like a bankrupt economy. <laughs> it is. We have actually announced that. Yeah. But how did we get here? Exactly. So we got here when we behaved as if there is no tomorrow. When you manage an economy, you expect that the economy is linked to the global economy. Mm -hmm. And so you build resilience for occasions where the global economy imposes some external shocks on you that you need to deal with. So you have to reset at that time. But at least you have some reserve, you have some buffer that will allow you to run for some time. Mm -hmm. So that you don't immediately press the panic button and go borrowing as if there's no tomorrow. So they built an economy when by, by 2020, when whatever they claim, COVID and whatever you came, the IMF reports in its uh, uh, Article 4 consultation that we had zero fiscal balance, mm -hmm. zero cash buffers. OK. Other countries, when it arrived, they had buffers. So they could deal with the problem before calling for external help. We, from day one, had zero cash buffers. OK. Then you also make sure that in managing the economy, you always create buffers in terms of what you call the fiscal buffers. So you don't, you don't, you don't crowd out your entire fiscal space. Because when there is a problem and you need to expand the fiscal, there must be room to do that. We arrive at a point where just two, three items finish or everything else. And in fact, we're in deficit. That before we could even pay wages and compensation, before we could actually pay interest payments, the money is finished. Whatever Ghanaians and foreigners gave us as donor money is finished. So we're already borrowing because what we call the primary expenditures, your total expenditures minus interest payments. When it is not met, it means that you actually borrow to pay the debt or the interest on the debt. Because if you have your primary expenditures fully covered, okay, then it means that if you borrow, you are now borrowing to pay the interest payment because it is all expenditures minus interest. Mm -hmm. In our situation, we are not even, even able to meet all the primary uh, uh, expenditures, let alone leave some to cover interest payment. So we now borrow to finance some of the primary expenditures and borrow to finance fully the interest payment. What it then means is that you are accumulating, you are what we call the compound, your compounding your public interest, and that accelerates the rate of uh, uh, your debt accumulation. So that is what we're doing. We were just running an economy where we were not focused on even creating, build, even paying our obligations, let alone building buffers, a fiscal buffer. So when we were struck, the only money that was available at the time was money that did not belong to the fiscal, but that belonged to the stabilization fund. Is there anything in this budget which can be seen as surprising. So I'm looking at the budget yeah. and everything in it was predictable. Yes. No, there are no surprises. The only surprises are the spin. What I call the seminar points. This is the spin that, you know, for the first time, they actually came with what we used to call the Green Book. They came with two uh, volumes of the budget. One is dealing with what we traditionally know. And the other one is to tell us that, look, uh, Uncle Kwesi, your house will have constructed a road. When you know that the road is, there's no road there, do you have to give me a book? So there's another volume focused on telling you that what you know is not true. There's mm -hmm. something else you don't know. Mm -hmm. When you arrive at that, when you have to make extra effort to tell a simple story, it's quite clear that something is wrong. Because that is not the way you've gone about it. And so when we started seeing pictures, 
I said, you people, you don't learn. <laughs> so apart from the spin, mm -hmm. there's essentially no nothing in the budget. OK. Anyway, viewers, I mean, just to announce that we are not having any breaks at all in this conversation because of time constraints. Yeah. So, so we want to make the most of the time. Now, sir, here we are in a very deep hole. It's obvious. How do we get out of this very deep hole that we've run the economy into? First and foremost, we, the people of Ghana and governance requires that the managers of the economy are transparent with the people. Uh, first, it's an admission that we are in a difficult situation and, and, and be frank with and upfront with Ghanaians as to the level of, of, of the challenge. Unfortunately, it's being painted as if everything is all right. So you cannot even fathom these people taking any pieces of advice on board. You can see, I know you are not a fan of IMF, but even with the IMF program, you keep, they keep telling us uh, PC PEG is what is underlining it. Not even their ministers have seen any document called PC PEG. Not even members of parliament that have the mandate to approve policy have seen any such policy. It is operating like the normal, the same policy on Ghana beyond aid that created the situation we are in. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever saw even the contours of that policy. So the consultative process, is this a Ghana program? If it's a Ghana program, who has inputted it? I mean, members made no input because we are not simply aware, and yet you are telling us that is what is getting out of the woods. You remember immediately after 2020, they came and said, Ghana cares about Tampa. Suddenly, it doesn't find expression in the budget. What has happened to that? You said that was a blueprint that was going to leverage 100 billion Ghana cities to grow the economy mm -hmm. and prosperity. All of a sudden, we don't hear Ghana cares any again. We hear another one, they say, PCP. We don't know what it is. So we are not able to make an input. Ghanaians are not being carried along to participate in the governance of our country and to participate in, in the solutions. When the opposition leader and the government and the president in waiting, that's deep thinking with together with his party and have a very thoughtful, well researched program which can kick start the revolution, which can restart the development of our country. What you see is lack of decorum. What you see is lack of, of candor. What you see is a leadership built on anger and arrogance. Whereas this is a contest of ideas. This is not a shouting match. Yeah, I mean, we the people now, at least we have two options yeah, before us. Yes. <laughs> There's the option of what Dr. Baumia describes as the blue economy. Yes. And then there is the option of the 24-hour economy. Exactly. So it is, it is a contest of ideas. All of this, what do they mean? 24-hour economy, blue and, and, economy, and, exactly. and so I think what, that what do they mean? I think that has to be the conversation. Yes. And not attacks, shouting over the moon. It's not a shouting match. It's not a mm. contest of who can attack best. Mm -hmm. It is a contest of how do we get out of the quagmire that you have put us in. When we say a 24-hour economy, some call it a 24-7 economy, some call it a nighttime economy. It's an economy that, con that, that reconfigures the culture of working. Mm -hmm. It said that businesses realize that the full potential of their business is not limited to 8 to 5 p.m. And that the resources that they have employed in their businesses can be optimized over the full stretch of the 24 hours that Ghanaians, uh, the world has given us. Mm -hmm. Which means that whereas some have closed and are going home, there is another group of people who can come to work. Okay, and when they close, another group arrives here. What it means is that you have the potential to increase the numbers of people you employ, giving opportunity to the unemployed youth that they will find jobs. Mm -hmm. Never mind whether it is in the night or at some point in time you rotate and they come in the morning. So that is the first point. Now, there are certain activities that really lend themselves to continuous 24 hours if you optimize them. Let mm -hmm. me give you an example. If you go to the airport, uh, the, the passport office, 
and they take your application. They process you. They take all your fingerprints and everything. What is a bottleneck? The bottleneck is a processing. So what stops passport office from saying that when you have closed at 5 p.m., somebody will come to work and continue processing the passports. So by the time you come to work in the morning the next day, a lot of passports are processed. Mm. Those passports are not waiting for you to go and sleep and come back in the morning and process them. It doesn't mean that everybody working in immigration office or passport office will be required for that night. Mm -hmm. But at least certain activities that are constrained by the fact that you need to abandon them and go and sleep and come back can continue. Mm -hmm. If you apply for a license and they've taken all your details, it's level processing. Why won't somebody be able to come in the morning and deploy those resources that are there to process those passports? Mm -hmm. So you don't spend one week waiting for your passport, but the next day you can come and pick your passport. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're having problems with a uh, Ghana card. It is, not, it is not a problem of the people that are queuing. It is a problem of the backlog in the engine room. That engine room can be operated for 24 hours. So you see that the output goes up, the economy expands, income levels improve, your GDP gets better, and your, uh, the government is able to collect more money from that to develop this country. Mm -hmm. So if you have other ideas, bring them. Nobody stops you because you already have a deficit in terms of policy options. You have given us a lot of policies that we expect you to start accounting for them. We expect you to now come and tell us one million of a constituency, what happened that I don't know they didn't get it, even though I'm a member of parliament and represent a constituency. Your work is to come and tell us how one district, one factory, became the policy that you expected the private sector to implement your promise. Mm -hmm. The private sector was not on a campaign platform. Then you ended up painting older factories like uh, Casa Prego. You need to account for that. And all you are doing is that you are complaining that you are not raising revenue, but you are throwing billions of Ghana cities in the name of, uh, of, of tax exemptions to your cronies. You should be explaining that. You should be explaining how you said that you are going to invest our money to build dams that will enable us to have all year farming and dry season farming. And yet by January, there are no, there's no water in your dugouts to even let chicken drink. You should be explaining that. You should be explaining to us how you said Ghanaians, every Ghanaian will have a bank account and ended up closing the banks, said that they don't even have the banks to go and open their accounts. And you close 422 financial institutions. You should be explaining that. When Ghanaians got frustrated that the banks that you deceived them that they can go and open the banks' uh, accounts are not available, they moved to open accounts with their wallets, only to realize that it was a trap for you to come there and remove your share with e-levy. You should be explaining that. You should be explaining to us how you said that you were going to build 36 seater toilets. <laughs> Never mind that toilets are for district assemblies. But a whole vice president went and said that he was speaking even in three, you know. Uh, maybe see 32 toilets. Uh, the next moment, you should be explaining how the people who were supposed to use a toilet got sacked from where they live. They were removed from there. Mm -hmm. And to date, you have even dug a foundation. You should be explaining to that to us. You should be explaining to us that you said that within 18 months, there no problem. There will be no problem of water and sanitation, toilets, within 18 months, and we are in seven years, and we still are digging boreholes. You should be explaining that. And so, before you can even think about another promise, you should redeem those promises. And that is the conversation we want. And he seems very frustrated at himself that he has arrived at a time when Ghanaians now know him better. He has arrived at a time when the benefit of the doubt has been removed. He has arri arrived at a time where Ghanaians are not ready for experiments, but want to have reliable hands. And that is the, 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 the reason why he's angry and arrogant and all of that, which really are attributes not suitable for leadership. Now, sir, well, what's your understanding of the uh, blue economy, which appears to be on offer by <coughs> Dr. Baumia? 
It's talking about blue economy. What is it? So the blue economy is actually about maximizing the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And he's not told us what we can do other than the fishing that we've been doing. You know, he, he, he has not told us other than ensuring that you maximize fish production. And of course, you are aware that our fish production has declined significantly. Mm -hmm. He's not told us what it is that he didn't know for all these seven years that suddenly he would do. So the blue economy we all know has been with our great great grandfathers. We have been at sea for so many years. Of course, we realized that we needed to enhance their capacity with landing uh, sites and all of that. But that is already in the works. So when you say blue economy, of course, they like high sounding words. It simply means fishing and whatever it is that you can use the sea for. When you are there permitting petroleum to deny our poor fish farmers harvest and catch, you should be focusing on that, tropoli, uh, petroleum. You should be focusing on the fact that the very basic premise fuel has become an MPP looting brigade uh, target. That even the farmers, if they were to buy premise fuel, it was easier in John Mahmoud's time when they could buy a whole gallon of, 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 of petrol or diesel for 14 Ghana cities, a whole gallon, and you are selling just a liter for that 14 cities. Even in some instances last year, we were buying it for 24 Ghana cities. And you expect to do something with blue economy? Look, we've gone past accepting experiments. It is these naive experimental policies. And I've heard him say that he was just a vice president and Bro? You said he was the Aplanke. He uh, was not the uh, So he was the Aplanke. Yes. So Aplanke delivers a lecture. And the line hook and sinker, the lecture knows, becomes a party manifesto. It doesn't end there. They become government policy, instigated by you, funded by the state. When they started, you were all over the place shouting that you are the one who, are, who is doing all this. In fact, even in government, you were still trying to hold a lecture and you claimed that it was a stakeholder consultation. And you said, we have done better. Yeah, it was a special appointee. Yeah. So a special appointee who is listened to, who is giving the money to do the work. Is it moving from taxation to production that you were not funded? It was your first budget. Go and find out the origin. It originated from your classroom lectures, became MPP manifesto, and you insisted at the head of economic management team that it should be the first tranche of your budget, and it was implemented. You actually followed up to parliament to ensure that it did not disappear along the way. You supervised it being read. You said one district, one factory, from day one. You followed up to supervise to be sure that it was not somehow removed after you agreed. One district, uh, one village, one down. You followed up. One million per constituency. Suddenly you develop some funny, funny development authorities and even though you know, and it will be the height of ignorance that you do not know that Ghana's administrative structures do not start from constituencies. Sir, <laughs> both the so-called majority and so-called minority in parliament agree that our finance minister is no good. Why is he still there? A very interesting question. The finance minister is powerful than the president. And it is quite clear that whatever he's doing is heavily supported by the president. You cannot be a strong finance minister if you don't get the backing of your president, because you won't last. But in this particular case, if he sacks him, they'll go and solve it at home. He doesn't want to carry the problems of government to the house. 
So he's there. And this is a president who doesn't even have the guts and the courage to do a reshuffle. Not to talk about firing his own cousin. In parliament, even when the 98 MPs, the agenda 98 people, were very loud and clear that they wanted him out of government, which has never happened in the history of our country. They were shipped in line. When they were saying all those things, a minority decided to test them to see whether they really, really believed in what they were saying. It became very clear that they were shipped in line and they abandoned the course. But where we are now, the harm is already done. It is important that he faces a tune to the end and goes home with the disgrace that he has created for this country. You are record to have described him as an economic magwai. <laughs> an interesting conversation. Well, it was, it was not him. It was the vice president. Oh, the vice president? Yeah, it was, was the, the vice president. Maguire. Oh, yes. Uh, it does appear that you no longer think <laughs> that the vice president fits that description. Or that no. Maguire should be compared to the vice president. Yeah, so, so, what so over time, I have watched the vice president, I've watched Maguire. And it does appear that it is a very wrong comparison. It's a very wrong comparison because I compared a very huge talent who took on criticisms and feedback from across the world, including myself, and turned that into motivation and focus on doing the talking on the field. And the results are there to show that after that, he, he, he had a couple of patches, but he's been outstanding for club and country. Contrary, Hanawa Maguire, That's Dr. Bob Dr. Yeah. Mahmoud Baumia has gotten worse. You know, he's gotten worse. So is it not wrong that I compared such a huge talent who was going through just a period uh, of patches of difficulty and had the potential, you know, <laughs> to, 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 to come good with a dead horse? <laughs> you know, a spent force, really. So the comparison in the first place was wrong. And when he started performing, I felt that in all sincerity, and genuinely, I felt that I owed him an apology on the same platform and with the same force. But why wants you to go to Old Trafford? He's inviting you to Old Trafford. Are you going to Old Trafford? Yeah, that, well, I, I need to say that at some point when my, my routine and my, my, my time permits, I'm, I'm a lover of football. Uh, so yes, it will be good to, to apologize to him in person and to bring finality and closure to this conversation. So if it is possible, why not? It's a, it's a great invitation. Don't forget that he, he was the, the captain of, of England. And uh, we all know that he, had, he was a captain of Manchester United. We all know that it is only a few who had the kind of summer that he had where there was contemplation of him going to West Ham for a token 30 million from a player that was bought for over 80 million. Even though the clubs agreed, he said, I am not going to negotiate personal terms. I want to stay at Manchester United and fight for my place. And that's exactly what he's done. Obviously, there's a lot to learn from such a man. And I would wish to say thank you for your humility. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure. Thank you very, very, very pleasure. much. Thank you very much. Well, viewers, we've just been in conversation with the Honorable Isaac Adongo, and we've been talking the economy. <laughs> Please stay with us until we meet again because we bring you the best in everything. Best in news, best in current affairs, best in everything. And uh, I'd like to say thank you also to the guy who, who directed the show, Adam Lumo, to the producer, George Venet, and to Lydia, our floor manager. Bye-bye until we meet again. Bye-bye.